Okay, so we are going to talk about this morning diabetes, um, both in dogs and cats. So again, if you have any questions about anything afterwards, you can uh, email me, uh, david.bruet at vcahospitals.com. And then again, all of the slides uh, are on this website, uh, veterinarydiagnosticinvestigation.com. So if you have any reason to go back and look at it, you certainly can. One of the things that um, recently came out was a paper that came out of Europe uh, from a veterinary insurance company. And this is, it's interesting because pet insurance in Europe is a little bit different, well, actually a lot different than it is here. So in Sweden, where this paper originated, probably about 40% of the dogs and almost 40% of the cats uh, have health insurance. And as a result of the health care plans that are available, um, once you enroll into the plan, basically health care after that is free. Uh, the one difference uh, in the Swedish company is that once the pets become, I think it's 12 years of age, then insurance sort of goes away. There is no insurance after that. But they went back and they looked at uh, over 1 million dogs and cats that had, under, that had uh, been under their insurance policy, and they looked by diseases, uh, all diseases where claims were submitted and all diseases where a disease was listed as the cause of the mortality. And one of the diseases they looked at was diabetes. And the frightening thing was, is despite the fact that you know, these pets were insured and that the costs for treating those diseases were covered, what they discovered was that both in dogs and cats, the average survival time for a dog and a cat that was diagnosed with diabetes was crazy short. And the number of animals that were euthanized within the first 24 hours was 25%. So 25% of the dogs and cats within one day of that diagnosis were being euthanized by their owners. And they weren't being euthanized because they were that ill. They were being euthanized because of perceptions that the owners had about what that meant in terms of having to treat their diabetic dog or cat. I don't know what the numbers are like. We're actually working with some companies now to try and get similar data. In the U.S., I certainly hope it's not 25% of dogs and cats get whacked on day one, um, but it's possible. And when again, when we talk to pet owners about um, their concerns about treating a diabetic dog or cat, I think one of the things that we have to do as a veterinarian is to allay their fears and basically allow them to understand that the way we view diabetes in dogs and cats right now is that we view diabetes in cats as a reversible disease, something that they likely won't have to live with forever. And we view diabetes in dogs as a chronic disease. And despite the fact that it's chronic, they're not going to go on and develop all of the long-term sequelae of diabetes that they're worried about, um, that they know about on the human side. So when we look at um, that study and looked at the number one cause of death in diabetic dogs and cats, it actually ended up uh, being owner-elected euthanasia. Now when we further look at that, the, a lot of the questions that the owners uh, came up with were um, time, commitment, and expense of treating a diabetic, which in the insurance model was zero. Um, there was no expense because everything was free. They were very concerned about what they would have to do on a daily basis in terms of taking care of their dog or cat. You know, are they going to have to do multiple blood sugars a day? What do they do if they're out of town? Um, what happens if the pet is sick? Um, what are they supposed to do in the middle of the night or if they're having an emergency? They were very concerned about uh, diabetes, as I said, being a chronic illness and therefore shortening the lifespan of the dog or the cat who is diagnosed with diabetes. And again, our goal is really to kind of turn that fear into letting them know that for most dogs and cats, the potential for having a really good quality of life, um, if not a normal uh, life expectancy, is quite good. And we try and de-emphasize or at least uh, allay their fears that what they're going to have to do is going to be so onerous that they need to elect to put their animals to sleep. One of the big issues that we talk about with dog and cat owners is the difference between um, human diabetes and dog diabetes. So the, one of the big issues is, is that people with diabetes live with the disease for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Dogs and cats don't, don't live with the disease that long. And so a lot of the long-term complications that people get, uh, the nephropathies, retinopathies, uh, neuropathies, both micro and macrovascular disease, stroke and heart attack, dogs and cats don't really get those things. And the reason they don't get them is because they just don't live with the illness long enough. And if you look at the, uh, the data, we were at the uh, American Diabetes Association meeting, 
If you look at the data, it's actually quite uh, scary. When you look at the healthcare implications of both insulin and non-insulin dependent diabetes in the United States. So right now, the diabetes is the number one cause of renal transplantation in the U.S. It's the number one cause of acquired blindness in the U.S. because of vascular changes in the retina. It causes uh, painful uh, sensory and motor neuropathies. It causes uh, small vessel disease, which leads to amputation. And it causes macrovascular disease, which leads to stroke and heart attack. And it's the number two contributing factor to stroke and heart attack in the United States. Animals don't get the nephropathies. They do get visual problems in terms of cataracts, at least in dogs. Uh, but that's reversible. Uh, we can take the cataracts out. You've all seen cats with the motor neuropathy, where they're walking uh, on their tarsi, they're down in their back legs. But it's not a sensory neuropathy. It's not associated with paresthesia or pain, and it's reversible. And again, they don't get uh, the vascular diseases uh, that people run into. And one of the things, too, that we talked about is this kind of idea of what's called compression of morbidity, which means you know a cat or dog lives out a 15 or 16 year lifespan at the same time we're living out an 80 year lifespan. And so again, with diabetes, all of the long term sequelae of things that go wrong with the human diabetic are all related to the amount of time you spend uh, with an elevated blood sugar. And we'll talk about strategies to mitigate that uh, in dogs and cats. <clears throat> what percentage of dogs do you think develop cataracts uh, within the first two years of treatment? And this was a paper that came out a couple of years ago that looked at dogs that were actually being well controlled clinically. They went to their veterinarians on a regular basis. They were having glucose monitoring done. And despite that, what percent do you think ended up developing cataracts? So how many think it was a quarter of the dog? 60% of the dog. 70% of the dog. 80% of the dog? Okay, good. So it's about 70 to 75% develop diabetic-induced cataracts despite the fact that you and the owner are doing everything that you can. So this is, again, something that we have to talk to the owners about in the beginning so that they don't get frustrated. Um, again, the diabetic-induced cataracts, assuming that they don't have retinal disease, are things that we can treat. And if you're a veterinary ophthalmologist, this is actually really good. There's a lot of veterinary ophthalmologists out there with license plates on their uh, BMWs that say, you know, cataract. So um, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So first we're going to talk about dogs with respect to pathogenesis, and then later on we'll talk about uh, cats and explain the difference why cats are uh, sometimes frustrating and also why cats are good, because the disease in a cat actually can be a reversible one. If we look at the cause of diabetes in dogs, most likely uh, what we're dealing with is an autoimmune disease. So most dogs that develop diabetes develop it because they develop antibodies against some protein in their islets, and they start an inflammatory response in their islets. And once they lose 75, 80, 85 percent of islet function, then the dogs go from being normal to being hyperglycemic after a meal to being hyperglycemic during a fast, and then the hyperglycemia results in glycosuria and results in the clinical signs. So the autoimmune thing is probably the most common, and as we talked a little bit about if you were here in the other talk, autoimmune endocrine disease in the dog probably results in multiple autoimmune endocrine disorders. So if we diagnose diabetes uh, in a four-year-old dog, we usually tell the owners that we're going to have to look for other autoimmune endocrine diseases uh, in that dog, such as hypothyroidism, uh, Addison's disease, and hypoparathyroidism. Genetics, we're not sure. It's a mess in the dog in terms of is there a single gene? No. Are there multiple genes? Probably. Uh, we don't know the mode of transmission. We don't know the specific genes that are being affected. So we don't really have any genetic-based tests. In humans, there are definitely uh, certain genes that predispose people to disorders causing insulin resistance. And then later in life, insulin resistance results in the development of diabetes. We also know in people that with certain genetic predispositions, if they get a viral infection, uh, when they're uh, under the age of 10, some of these viral infections will trigger ileitis and result in insulin-dependent diabetes in, in children. Never been shown really to be an issue in a dog, uh, although we have found and people have found uh, viral inclusion bodies in the pancreas of dogs with diabetes. In dogs, like we said, autoimmune disease is most common. The second most common form of diabetes in dogs are probably disorders resulting in insulin resistance. And insulin resistance states occurring in older dogs 
predispose them to beta cell uh, hyperfunction, so the beta cells are secreting lots of insulin to try and keep up, and eventually they can't keep up anymore, uh, and diabetes will ensue. And then we've all dealt with chronic pancreatitis, especially in dogs like schnauzers that have chronic relapsing bouts of pancreatitis, and eventually the exocrine pancreatic inflammation results in spillover to inflammation affecting the beta cells, resulting in beta cell loss. And one of the issues with pancreatitis in dogs that are developing it is that some of these dogs have chronic pancreatitis and are not showing symptoms. And that disorder is chronically uh, resulting in islet cell loss. And also you'll have dogs come in with acute pancreatitis that are overtly diabetic, and then the diabetes resolves as the pancreatitis resolves. Um, and usually in that scenario, what we have to warn the owners about is that that's great, but chances are, uh, as the dog continues to live on through his life, he's probably going to have other bouts of pancreatitis, whether it's clinical or subclinical, um, and may end up becoming diabetic. Now, if we look at the breed predisposition of dogs with diabetes, um, it's all over the, the map. Fortunately, juvenile, like uh, diabetes being diagnosed in puppies, is very rare. And usually when we see uh, juvenile diabetes, it's almost always in association with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So they have EPI, they don't have an exocrine pancreas, and they also uh, lack eyelids. And those dogs are crazy hard to regulate because as we're adjusting insulin dose to control hyperglycemia and dealing with enzyme replacement for their exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, their weights are constantly changing, the amount of body fat and you know, muscle mass they have is constantly changing, uh, so they're quite difficult to manage. The dogs in the younger age groups, four, five, and six-year-old dogs, that's the autoimmune diabetic dogs. And then the older dogs are the dogs that are probably getting it because of insulin resistant states or getting it because of uh, chronic pancreatitis. We know that there are breed <coughs> predispositions, which probably means there's some genetic component to it, but again, we don't exactly know what genes are being affected. And we know that females are more affected than males. And this probably reflects in the dog uh, the presence of the autoimmune endocrine disorder because most autoimmune endocrine uh, diseases in the dog are going to be much more common in females uh, than they are in males. Now, the clinical signs of diabetes are simple. You know, all the classic signs of diabetes, the PUPD, polyphagia, weight loss. Basically, if you look at diabetes um, from a metabolic standpoint, it's a disease of starvation. So they can't utilize... Uh, carbohydrates, so in an attempt to uh, make energy substrates like ketones, they have to break down fat and they have to break down muscle. So what we end up with is um, fairly significant PUPD because of glycosuria, which results in a secondary polydipsia. They're polyphagic because, again, they're trying to eat as they're losing weight. Um, despite the fact that they're eating more, uh, weight loss is persistent because they just can't simply take in enough calories to keep up with the catabolic effects of breaking down muscle uh, and breaking down fat. Clinical dehydration is pretty rare unless they have a concurrent illness. So unless there's something that's preventing that dog or cat from taking in water, then usually they're going to be euhydrated on physical exam unless uh, something pushes them to the point of not being able to drink. We talked a little bit about the neuropathies in cats, the plantigrade stance, that's motor, uh, directly related to uh, poor glycemic control. Basically, they get uh, glycosylation of the myelin sheath. And it's kind of weird because if you look at, even though we see it clinically in the cat, it occurs in the dog. So if you look at all diabetic dogs and you were to do EMGs and nerve conduction velocities, you'd find that they all have the neuropathy. It's just that for whatever reason, cats are much more sensitive to it in terms of causing a gait abnormality. And the nice thing, again, about these neuropathies in cats is that they're reversible. So once you get glucose control, you get their fructosamines down and their average blood sugars are normal, then you're going to see <coughs> reversal of the neuropathy, which can take anywhere from weeks to months uh, in order for the neuropathy to go away. Cataracts, like we said, 70 75% of dogs get cataracts. Um, cats, it's crazy rare, and people have been trying to figure out well, what's the difference between a dog and a cat with respect to the way their lens handles glucose. Haven't really found a difference. Uh, the sorbitol pathway in the lens seems identical in the dog or the cat, um, but for whatever reason, the cat is much more resistant. If you see icterus at the time of diagnosis in a dog with diabetes, it almost always reflects concurrent pancreatitis. 
And when you see Icarus in a cat with concurrent diabetes, it could be one of 9,000 diseases because that's the way the cat is. So it could be pancreatitis, it could be lipidosis, it could be plangiohepatitis, it could be triaditis, it could be lots of different things. And part of that reasoning is because the anatomy of the dog and the cat is different with respect to uh, where the bile ducts and the pancreatic ducts enter into the small intestine. So in the cat, everything enters through one common papilla. So anything that causes focal inflammation in the proximal duodenum uh, is going to cause an issue. Whereas in the dog, uh, multiple ducts exist, multiple entries into the duodenum uh, are present. And then if they don't feel good, um, they're not going to groom themselves. Now, at the American Diabetes Association meeting, the, the, you know, the thrust of those meetings is glycemic control. You know, to delay the progression of all the bad things that happen with diabetics, everything's about very, very rigid uh, glucose control. And they do that with a combination of things. They do it with a combination of multiple blood sugar uh, testing uh, throughout the day, multiple insulin injections, both short-acting and long-acting insulin preparation, the use of uh, insulin pumps, implantable pumps, the use of artificial pancreas, the use of pancreatic transplantation, the use of islet transplantation, all of these things are designed to make that person euglycemic. And there's no doubt that the data shows that the more rigidly they're controlled, the fewer complications they have. The other thing that's pretty obvious is the more rigidly they're controlled, the more prone they are to hypoglycemic reactions. And so there's always a cost-benefit uh, analysis being done in terms of how hard do you push them in order to control their sugars, but not at the same time make them go low. We don't have to do that. You know, we don't have to make dogs normal in order for them to live a, a good quality of life. They don't have to be euglycemic. In dogs, they basically just need to have their average blood sugar stay below renal threshold. And renal threshold in a dog for glucose is about 180. So if we can keep their average blood sugar at 180 or less, they won't be glycosuric for the majority of the day. They won't be PUPD. They should be able to gain weight um, they should be largely asymptomatic uh, in that respect. And so our goal is not in the dog, is generally not reversal of the diabetes, but it's control of the blood sugars to the point where we're keeping them below renal threshold. In the dog, we'd like to slow or delay the progression of cataracts, fully admitting that we're going to fail, uh, but it would be nice to try. We'd like to maintain ideal body weight because we know obese dogs and obese cats are insulin resistant. And we know that thin dogs and thin cats who are diabetic are predisposed to ketoacidosis. So there's a, a reason why we'd like to keep their body weights consistent. We don't like fluctuation. And we'd also like to try and keep them as close as we can to an ideal body weight. And then we'd like to avoid hypoglycemic reactions because pet owners hate hypoglycemic reactions. I mean, admittedly, it's bad for the dog or the cat. But owners hate it because it freaks them out. They get very concerned that they've done something wrong, that there's going to be more hypoglycemic reaction. It's expensive. They have to go to the emergency clinic to deal with hypoglycemic reactions. So we want to try and develop ways that they can manage those conditions or recognize them at home and look at protocols with insulin that don't necessarily result in pushing the dog towards hypoglycemia. Um, although in the cat, our goal in the cat really is to reverse the diabetes. We're trying to get them off of insulin. So we're going to treat them a little bit more aggressively than the dog. So what we talk to with owners is that we're going to go through uh, a variety of things. We're going to talk to them about the role of diet, uh, what diets to feed, what not to feed, when to feed them relative to the insulin, uh, how many times a day we're going to feed them. We talk to them about the insulin preparations that we have available, which you know the bad news is in veterinary medicine it changes about every four minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what we currently know. We, we talk to them because they're going to ask us, because they're either diabetic or someone in their family is diabetic, they're going to want to know, well, can I avoid insulin? Can we use a, an oral hypoglycemic agent uh, so that we don't have to give shots? And I think uh, the use of oral hypoglycemic agents is probably the best way to convince a pet owner they should give a shot, um, because once they, you know, they opt for the oral pill in a cat, um, they will come back and, and ask for an injection. Uh, preferably with a really large gauge needle. Um, but we will talk about the role of oral hypoglycemics and dogs or cats. We're not going to spend much time talking about concurrent illness other than to recognize later on this morning when we talk about insulin resistance that there's literally 20 or 30 things that could cause an insulin resistance state 
most of those are related to concurrent illness. And yeah, we want to know uh, what concurrent illnesses are going to be present. Um, and one of the things that we have to remember with a diabetic dog or a diabetic cat is that as they go through the rest of their life, we need to be able to recognize that they're going to get every other dog and cat disease on the face of the planet uh, and not just focus on them or label them as being a diabetic. There was a, a really interesting paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine two years ago which looked at the quality of health care that diabetic patients receive globally versus the quality of health care of non-diabetic patients. And what the supposition was is that diabetics, because they were going to the doctor all the time, probably received superior health care to people who weren't diabetic. And what ended up being shown in the paper is that if you were a diabetic, you got labeled as a diabetic, you saw your endocrinologist primarily, you saw your internist not so much, and what it ended up being the result is that the diabetics weren't being evaluated and screened for other diseases as effectively as they would have been if they weren't a diabetic. So I think it probably happens with us, I know it happens in our charting system, that something comes in sick and it says it's a diabetic, everything gets focused on, well, the diabetes is messed up. Uh, but again, they will get every other disease out there. And then you do have to identify the person in the family who's uh, cognitively intact. Um, who is the owner um, that you're going to talk to about all these things, who you're going to give all these instructions to, who's going to be doing the day-to-day -day, uh, management uh, of that diabetic patient in order to make sure that the information is being transmitted. And we'll talk a little bit about management of uh, that situation. So let's talk about insulin. Um, you know, the, the basic issue with insulin preparations in the United States and throughout the world is that the market is human. Uh, that's where the money all comes from. So the use of animal-derived insulins has gotten less and less and less as time has gone by. The question is coming, and it always comes up, is that, well, as veterinarians who are dealing with dogs and cats, how much of this is an issue for us? Um, the potential issue comes up with the amino acid sequence of insulin. So the theory is, is that if you give a foreign protein twice a day to an animal, that the animal will make antibodies against that foreign protein, which then will neutralize the positive effects of the insulin. And so what we know is that dog insulin and pig insulin are identical. They have the same amino acid sequence. And so in theory, and in fact, in fact, giving dogs porcine-derived insulin results in no anti-insulin antibodies in the circulation and no insulin resistance as a result of the potential formation of anti-insulin antibodies. In the cat, the cat, of course, has an amino acid sequence of insulin that's unlike any other species on the face of the planet. So in theory, you would think that every cat who receives any form of insulin will make anti-insulin antibodies. And the reality is, is that uh, Margaret Honing did a nice study looking at cats that received a variety of insulin preparations. And what she found was that only 13% of cats made anti-insulin antibodies or had measurable anti-insulin antibodies in their serum and none of those cats had insulin resistance as a result of those anti-insulin antibodies. So that's probably a really good news for us because that means that having to use primarily human or human recombinant insulin products is probably not going to be uh, that big of a deal. And we'll talk about uh, the different types of insulin that are currently on the market for human use and uh, for veterinary use. So when I came out of vet school, when I was an intern and a resident, we, there were really three types of insulins that were on the market. There were fast-acting insulins, intermediate and long-acting insulins. Now what's out there is that there are five different classes of insulins uh, that are on the market, uh, all of which, again, are primarily designed to be used in humans. And two of the classes of insulins, the ultra-fast-acting and the uh, basal insulins, uh, like large and Detamir, are the newest acting insulins, are the newest uh, preparations. Ultra-fast acting insulins are basically insulins that have had certain amino acid substitutions to the human insulin molecule, which makes them crazy rapidly absorbed. And so if you look at the onset of action of Humalog and Novolog, the onset of action is within five minutes of the subcutaneous injection. The, the peak effect is about 60 to 90 minutes. Duration of action is only three to four hours. These are insulins that people take at the time of a meal. So they eat a meal, they take an ultra-fast-acting insulin, and then at night when they go to bed, they take a basal insulin. Um, the theory is the basal insulin prevents hyperglycemia from occurring during uh, sleep, during fasting, and these ultra-fast-acting insulins work 
to blunt postprandial hyperglycemia. And one of the evils of diabetes in dogs, cats, and humans is postprandial hyperglycemia. That's one of the things that results not only in persistent clinical signs, but results in the progression of all the complications of the diabetes. So one of the goals of insulin treatment in people uh, and in uh, dogs and cats is to blunt that postprandial response. And what you'll see clinically in practice is that you'll have dogs who are coming in for a glucose curve or the owner's doing a glucose curve. They feed the dog, they give the insulin, and what you notice is that for the first four hours, the blood sugars actually go up rather than come down. So you see the glucose go up after a meal, then you see the insulin kick in and the blood sugars go away. That's something that we would like to eliminate either through diet or through uh, switching up insulins. Now these ultra-fast acting insulins, we don't really use these in uh, veterinary medicine because they're crazy potent insulins and the problem would be if an animal didn't eat or didn't eat all of his meal and gets a dose of these ultra-fast acting insulins, he's probably going to get hypoglycemic. Plus, this would mean an owner is going to have to give multiple shots a day, you know, shots at each meal, uh, and then something, uh, some type of a long-acting insulin injection at night in order to prevent uh, fasting hyperglycemia. The fast-acting insulins are really regular insulin. Okay? And what's the primary indication that we use regular insulin? Where do you guys primarily use it? For DK. Hey, we like it for DK because it has a relatively rapid onset of action. Duration of action is nice, five to eight hours, allows us to adjust the insulin dose based on the animal's blood sugars, the animal's pH, uh, what's going on with the ketoacidosis, what's going on with hydration. And then once the animal's feeling better and able to take in food and water and starting to take in consistent amounts of calories, then we're going to switch them from a regular insulin preparation to something more long-acting, to an intermediate or uh, a long-acting product. So you could use these, I suppose, to regulate a diabetic, but it would be sort of strange. The regular insulins, again, are more potent. Uh, so on a unit dose, uh, they're stronger. And you would have to give multiple shots a day. And probably what you would end up with is not a flattening of a curve, but you'd get a lot of up and down. And that's, again, something that we'd like to avoid. Where we primarily live in dogs are the intermediate acting insulins. And there's really two classes of intermediate acting insulin uh, that are available to us. One are the N class, the NPHs, which are human derived insulin. And basically, uh, those are insulin products that have been around for a long time. Probably NPH is the insulin that's been used the most in the dog uh, to treat diabetes. And then there's the use of uh, Vetsilin, which is now coming back on the market, thank God, uh, as a product from Merck. And Vetsilin is a Lenti class of insulin. Now, the Lenti insulins and NPH insulin are both classified as intermediate acting insulin, but they really do different things uh, in the body. So the Lenti class of insulin has the advantage in that it's really a mixture of two types of insulin preparations in the same vial. So what you get with a Lenti product is you get a fairly rapid onset of action. And that allows the blunting of postprandial hyperglycemia. And then you get a second insulin that kicks in later on, which helps prevent hyperglycemia between meals. And so the really nice thing about the lengthy uh, insulin product is that it does have that protective effect against uh, postprandial changes. And we'll talk more about uh, Vetsilin and the results of Vetsilin uh, use in both dogs and cats. And also some changes because those of you, how many people used Vets, the Vetsilin before, okay, when it was out there before? Yeah, so there's a lot of labeling changes that have occurred um, as the product was re-released. It's the same product that was in our vegetarian plow, but now it's got some different labeling stuff that we'll go over. The long-acting insulins, really, they don't, only one of them exists now, and that's PZI, the Prozin, uh, which is now from Beringer Engelheim, uh, which is a human recombinant. Uh, it's no longer porcine derived insulin. This is a human recombinant product. And then Humulin U, which is no longer on the market. And the only reason I leave Humulin U on there is to talk, to remind me to talk briefly about compounding insulin. And my suggestion to you is don't do it. I think now we have, as you're going to see, four or five insulins that are commercially available that we can use in both dogs and cats. We really don't need to be using compounded insulin products. And it's not because there's anything inherently wrong 
with compounding insulin. The problem is the variability of the stuff that you get in the bottle uh, from bottle to bottle is just never going to be identical. And so rather than worrying about erratic glycemic control being due to variation in the product that you're getting, we're just better off just going ahead and using a name brand product. Plus, there's, there's really no reason to dilute insulin anymore. There's no reason to make a U100 insulin U10 uh, in order to try and make it easier for an owner to measure small volume. The problem with diluting insulin is that you're not only diluting the amount of insulin, but you're diluting all of the things that make it ultra lenty, lenty, NPH, PZI, you're diluting out all of those things. So the characteristics of the insulin are, aren't going to be viable anymore. And really diluting some insulins is really contraindicated because if you dilute insulin like Vargene, what you're going to basically do is create NPH. So diluting that product really results in a huge pharmacokinetic difference. We also have insulin syringes now that can measure half unit. So there's no reason to get worried about somebody who's not able to measure a small quantity of insulin at any one time. And then the newest class of insulins are what are called the ultra-long-acting insulins. Or really, they're classified in humans as basal insulins. And this is Detamir or Levamir and then Glargine or Lantus. And these insulins now, basal insulins, are the number one prescribed insulin in the United States uh, to treat diabetes because they have some advantages over the other insulins. The, the one advantage that they have is that they're reasonably rapidly absorbed um, after uh, injection, but they're really described in people as being peakless insulin. So what happens with, uh, for instance, with glargine, glargine is uh, insulin that's had, again, some amino acid substitution put into the bottle at a pH of 4.5. And, and at a pH of 4.5, those insulin molecules stick together. So six insulin molecules basically glom onto each other. You inject that subcutaneously into the subcutaneous tissue where the pH is 7.4, and what you get is a slow release of insulin uh, from that injection. So things sort of leach out from the subcutaneous space into the vasculature. And so in humans, what you get is a very flat serum insulin concentration. And as a result of that, you get a very flat glucose curve. They basically don't curve. They just stay uniformly low or uniformly regulated. So most of the time, people are taking these basal insulins at, uh, in the evening because they're not taking in any calories, but your liver is continuing to produce glucose. So it helps uh, prevent uh, fasting hyperglycemia. And then during the day, they're either going to take these ultra-fast acting or they're going to take a regular insulin on top of taking a basal insulin. <clears throat> now we have, we're going to go through and show you data on both uh, glargine and detamir, both in dogs and cats and talk about when, uh, when we would want to consider using those products. This is my favorite graph of insulin, because this is supposed to be what happens when you give these different mixtures of insulin. None of this happens. Um, that's why diabetes is so much uh, fun, is that basically we're going to pick an insulin, pick a protocol, and then we're going to realize that that was probably not a good plan. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes uh, in insulin dosing as we go along, but it looks pretty. So let's first talk about cats, uh, and then we'll talk about dogs with respect to insulin. So I think right now, since Vetslin now has been reintroduced, we really have, if we look at cats, uh, five different insulins for which we have data on that support the use of the cat. So we have Vetslin, which is the porcine-derived uh, lenti. We have the humulin and anernobulin, which, and which is the human recombinant intermediate acting insulin. We have prozinc, which used to be animal-derived, but now is human recombinant uh, product, which is approved for use in the cat, as is Vetslin. We have glargine and detamir, which are the long-acting insulin analogs, the basal insulin, neither of which are approved for use in the cat, uh, but both of which we have data on uh, to support their use in the cat. So we're going to talk first about uh, glargine. Glargine was released originally, in, the, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, before it was approved for use in the U.S. And what happened is that we had the advantage of the Australian experience before we started to get the insulin over here. And Jackie Ran, who is an uh, internal medicine specialist in Queensland, did a lot of work on looking at these basal insulins in cats. And when she first started uh, reporting her results, we were all going, what the hell is this? Because she was reporting that she could take cats 
newly diagnosed diabetic cats, place them on a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, put them on the basal insulin like glargine, and she was getting these quite uh, impressive remission rates. 80 to 90% of the cats were no longer diabetic. And we thought, well, that's very interesting. Uh, a little bit strange, but a little bit interesting. She's continued to study this for probably uh, almost 10 years now and has been doing studies comparing remission rates using the various insulin products uh, in cats with diabetes. And so she had just published um, in 2009 a really nice paper that took 24 diabetic cats and randomized them into three groups. One group of cats got glargine insulin, uh, one group of cats got a protamine zinc insulin, and one group of cats got a lenti insulin. And she looked at not only degree of control of the diabetes in terms of clinical signs, but she looked at the percentages of the cats that would go into remission. And at the same time that they were putting these cats on these three different insulin products, they put them all on the same food. So they eliminated diet uh, as a compounding factor for um, the glucose responses. So we're gonna go through this a little bit because I think it's, it's very interesting and quite telling, and, and certainly this has been our experience looking at uh, large insulin. So again, these are newly diagnosed cats, have not yet received any insulin products. So what we're gonna see here, this is looking at serum fructosamine concentrations, starting pre-treatment, going through day 112, and if we look at the lenti cats versus the glargine cats versus the PZI cats, what you see is that they're pretty similar. In fact, statistically, they were identical in having very, very high fructosamine mm -hmm. values for treatment. If you look at the lenti group of cats and look at the, the drop or the change uh, in their serum fructosamines, they started out at 573, and they were down at about 480 after a day 112. If you look at the PZI cats, they started out at 568, but then again by week or day 112, they were still up over 500. Now, despite the fact that their fructosamines were high in both this group and this group, they did see some improvement in clinical signs in those cats. There was some reduction in PUPD uh, in some of the cats because they were bringing down, uh, at least in some uh, of the cats, bringing down their average blood sugar. The thing that was most telling though is when you looked at the glargine cats is that their serum fructosamines were significantly lower at day 28 and 56 than the other cats, and they were normal by day 84, and there were no cats who were diabetic by, at day 112. All eight cats in that study had reverted to normal, whereas there were two cats in the Lenti group and three cats in the PZI group that reverted back to normal. Now, the reversion back to normal of the two cats in the Lenti group and the three cats in the PZI group probably reflected two things. Part of it was diet, because we do see some cats who do have remission of diabetes just by being switched uh, from a regular cat food to a high-protein, low-carb diet. So some of the improvement and remission of the diabetes may have strictly been the food, or it could be it was a combination of the food and in those cats that had a good glycemic response to either PZI or Lenti, that resulted in them going into remission. The other thing that they looked at, again, was the, pro the proportion of cats going into remission. Again, a quarter of the cats in the Lenti group, 38% of the cats in the PZI group. Um, this is by day 42. That number didn't change uh, at day 112. So none of the cats in the PZI or Lenti group, there was any added benefit from day 42 to day 112, but 100% of the cats had gone into remission by day 112, and 75% of the cats had gone into remission by day 42. And that's been our experience with large, is that for us, the majority of the cats go into remission within the first 30 days, but what we usually do is give cats at least six months uh, before we decide that they're not gonna go into remission. And the median time from starting treatment to going into remission was 28 days in, in her cats, 35 and 19 days in these groups. And I think that what we see is that the cats that go into remission are likely to go into remission no matter what we do to them. But where the advantage of glargine is is in mopping up the other cats. Uh, they would not go into remission continuing to use a Lenti or a PZI type product. Now that doesn't mean, and we're gonna show data on Lenti and PZI, they're effective insulins to control hyperglycemia in cats. 
but I think if you're looking at a newly diagnosed cat and your goal and the owner's goal is to eliminate the diabetes, I think the data shows that using a basal insulin like Largene or using uh, Detamir, which we'll talk about in a little bit, probably is going to be better than using PZI or Lenti or NPH. Yeah, and this is just showing a little bit in a graphical form the proportion of cats that are going into remission. And again, in a stepwise fashion, this is each cat going into remission, uh, you know, the Glargine insulin wins. Now, when she first started looking at this stuff and looking at Glargine in cats, because she didn't really know what was going to happen, and she was trying to figure out the kinetics of it in cats, what she was doing is that she was enrolling cats in the studies, and she was having the owners measure their blood sugars at home. And what they would do is they would measure their cat's blood sugar once an hour, eight hours a day, six days a week. Now, the Australian pet owner is a weird breed, apparently, because I, you know, I don't know that I could get very many people to do that, uh, but she got them to do that, and that's when she started to get these crazy high remission rates, because what she was doing was really kind of what they were doing in humans, and that's adjusting the insulin dose based on the blood sugar, and she was driving the cats to you glycemia. I mean, she wanted the cats to be normal. And so in order to do that, she wanted to get multiple glucoses a day. She did give them one day off a week, which was very nice of her. What we've basically done in looking at all of the stuff that Jackie did was to try and develop a protocol that was less of a pain for the owners, that didn't require that many blood sugars from the cats, but would hopefully get the same remission rates. You know, we didn't want to sacrifice the percent of cats that go into remission because we were, didn't want the owners to do that much work. Now, the other day, I, if you were here, I probably told you that I hate the internet uh, for owners, but this is a really good website for owners uh, that we send all of our diabetic, both dog and cat owners to. So www.uq, for University of Queensland, uh, .edu, .au, uh, backslash ccah. And that's the website for uh, Jackie Rand's diabetes website. It has information for vets, dog and cat, for owner dog and cat. It has all of her papers uh, on that website. And it has a lot of tools for the owner and for vets in terms of why we're doing the stuff that we're about to talk about in terms of trying to get the cat to go into remission. Um, so I'd let owners go there and not let them go uh, to other websites. Now, when we're starting cats on Glargine, what we usually do is we start them at a half a unit per kilogram twice a day if their fasting blood sugar is greater than 360 and a quarter of a unit per kilogram twice a day if the fasting blood sugar is less than 360. And the reason that these numbers exist is because these are the numbers that Jackie found correlated to higher remission rate. Um, so um, they were basically extrapolated from all the data that she had in all of her diabetic cats. But then what we've been doing is instead of curving cats on Glargine, you don't have to curve them anymore, is that basically what we do is we take two blood sugars from the cats, or preferably, ideally, have the owners get two blood sugars from their cats uh, in a day. And so what we'll do is we'll start them on Glargine, we'll switch them to high protein, low carb if they're already not on that, we'll send them home, we'll tell them not to do anything for a week, and then a week after they start the glargine, they're going to take two blood sugars from their cat. They're going to take one pre-meal, pre-insulin. They're going to feed the cat and give it the insulin. And then four hours later, they're going to do one more spot VG on their cat. And that's it. That's a curve for a cat on a basal insulin. They don't have to take it every one or two hours for 12 hours in order to generate a curve. And the reason that we can get away with this is, again, because she's already run the experiment for us telling us that the four-hour blood glucose is highly predictive of the dose and highly predictive of what cat's going to go into remission. So we're going to use the pre- and the four-hour uh, post-glucoses uh, to dictate how we're going to adjust the dose of insulin. And it is important that you do it at home. I mean, that is one of the things that we talk to owners about is that if we're going to try this protocol in your cat and our goal is to get your cat to go into remission, and come off of insulin, then we really try and get them to do the at-home glucoses because of all of the issues that we'll talk about with trying to measure or interpret um, a high blood glucose in a cat that's in the hospital. That's fast. I'm sure that's normal. Okay, so what we do, and this is in your notes, is that when we bring, or when that owner is doing the blood glucoses a week later, 
if the pre insulin blood glucose is greater than 360 and the four hour post blood glucose is greater than 180, we're going to raise the dose. And you can raise it by a half a unit, that's totally fine, that's what Jackie would do is raise a half a unit. And if you're using the syringes that measure half a unit at a time, that's fine. Um, I'm just lazy, so I just raise it by one um, unit morning and evening. If their pre insulin blood glucose though is 270 to 360 and the four hour glucose is 90 to 180, this is a really good sign. This is telling you that this cat is likely going to go into remission. He probably is already starting to make insulin on his own. This isn't just the effect of the GLAR gene. This is probably reversal of the diabetes. So the insulin resistance state is probably going, uh, going away. And what I would do is just leave that cat alone. Leave him at the same dose of the insulin. Tell the owner, okay, we're going to repeat this again in seven days. Same thing up here. Once you raise the dose up here, you're going to bring that, or you're going to have the owner uh, recheck the glucoses one week later. If the pre-insulin blood sugar is 190 to 270 and the four hours 54 to 90, this is a cat that is, is most likely, again, going into remission. And these are cats where I would probably either, again, leave it the same, depending on their clinical sign. You know, are they still PUPD or not? What's happening with their weight? Or consider lowering the dose. Now, this is where things in Jackie's world get very weird. Uh, because... If we had seen in the past, if you were doing a blood glucose curve in a cat who was on uh, PZI, Lenti, NPH, Ultra Lenti, and you saw a four hour post insulin blood sugar of 54, you probably would be hysterical, uh, which I would be hysterical as well, because what that would mean is that that cat's probably on its way to getting uh, quite hypoglycemia. But in Jackie's world, 54 is normal. She believes that in the domestic short hair cat, a fasting blood glucose of 54 is totally acceptable. She's a little bit on the edge with that one, where it's not 100% accepted by reality. But what we can't argue with is that in her world and in the, in the cats on glargine, and it has been our experience, we don't see cats showing clinical signs of hypoglycemia, even though their blood sugar is 55 or 60. And so what she wants to do and what we're trying to do with this protocol is that since we're trying to reverse the diabetes in the cat, we want to push them to normal blood sugar. And so the thing that you do have to rely on, though, and we'll talk about later, is that you do need a glucose meter that knows the difference between 54 and 44. And that's very hard. And so there's only a couple of meters, so there's only one meter that I know of that works that well, and that's the alpha track meter. But it makes it important that if for a cat where we're pushing them like this and we're doing at home monitoring, that they're, they're probably going to have an alpha track meter at home. They're not going to have a human glucometer because they're not going to be able to tell what's really low from what's normal. And then the last scenario is a cat where their fasting blood sugar is less than 180 and now the four hour is actually low. It's below 54. At that point, we start lowering the dose. We don't stop insulin. We lower the dose. And so whatever dose they were on, I would lower it by one unit. So if they were on three units DID, they now go to two units DID, we check it in a week. If it looks like this in a week, we lower it by another unit and have to do it again in a week. So we're going to eventually go from three twice a day to two twice a day to one twice a day to one unit once a day and then off. And then they're going to come off the insulin. And then a couple of weeks after they're off insulin, we're going to have the owner do another glucose test. They're going to do a fasting blood sugar, they're going to feed the cat, no insulin, and then four hours later take another blood sugar. And if the cat's still in remission, then we're going to, again, keep them off insulin, have them stay on the diet, have them mix, try and maintain an ideal body weight, and then every three to four months, have them do another fasting blood sugar and another post prandial blood sugar. And if you do this, I think, what you're going to find is that you're going to see those types of remission rates. You're going to see 80, 90% of the cats going into remission uh, by using glargine and a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. Now, a lot of the questions that come up about uh, glargine, uh, or the common question about glargine is, well, if you do that and you attain diabetic remission, how long do they stay in remission? Are they going to stay permanently normal? Is there a chance that they're going to revert back to diabetes? And so, again, based on the long-term studies that she has, the vast majority of cats are going to stay non-diabetic as long as they stay on the food and they don't gain weight. 
And that's very important because one of the things with those high protein, low carb diets is that cats like them. They like high protein, low carb. And so if you allow them to eat and free feed, what you're going to find is that eventually they'll become obese if they just eat that stuff constantly. It's like cat crack for them. If then if they become obese, then for the reasons that we'll talk about later, that's going to accelerate beta cell loss and the diabetes could potentially come back. So they need to stay on the food, but they need to maintain ideal body weight. And if that happens, the chances of them staying in remission are probably 80%. She's only seen about a 20% relapse. You need to put them on a the diet before you start the insulin to adjust for the change? We usually just do it all at the same time. We do it at the same time. And, and that's a, that is a good point is that when we're switching them from whatever they were eating to the new food, you probably want to do it like over three to four days. Um, just because cats will vomit and get diarrhea just in the diet. So. Uh, when did you say that uh, the high protein diet, low carb, did we make it? What diet do we recommend? Or? No. Oh. Will they gain weight with that diet? Yes, they will gain weight. Why? Um, because, cat, well, we're going to talk about why. But it basically has to do with the fact that cats metabolically are carbohydrate intolerant. Um, they don't eat for carbs, they eat for protein. And so their, their metabolism is not set up to, gear with carb, to deal effectively with carbohydrates. They don't utilize them appropriately, but they are crazy good utilizers of, uh, utilizers of protein. So they're going to gain weight from them. If they do come out of remission, you start them again? Yes. Them yeah. If they go out of remission and they become diabetic, then we go back to glargine day one, just like you did before, and try and push them back into remission. Any place with fructosamines in this scenario? Yeah, we'll talk about fructosamines. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the other thing that, that she's been playing with, which is something that we just started about three or four months ago, is using glargine to treat DKA, not using regular insulin. Now, this is not for the faint of heart, I must say, <laughs> because when we first started doing this, we thought, holy crap, you know, we had multiple catheters in them because we knew for sure that something bad was going to happen, that we were going to drive them into hypoglycemia or that we weren't going to shut off ketone production. And there's a couple of things to remember about DKA in dogs and cats and humans. And the first thing is, is that the amount of insulin that you need to give to turn off ketone production is way lower than the amount of insulin that you need to give to make glucose come down. So you're shutting off ketogenesis almost immediately when you're giving insulin, despite the fact that you may not be seeing big changes uh, in serum uh, blood sugar concentrations. And so what she did, and this was uh, just came out in the Critical Care Journal, is that she took 15 cats uh, with, uh, they were presented with DKA. They were initially given an IM dose of glargine, so they either got one or two units based on the weight of the cat, and then in 12 of these 15 cats, at the same time, she gave them a single dose of sub q -large. Again, one to three units, it's a sliding scale based on the body weight of the cat. And then rather than intermittently giving them low-dose IM regular insulin, she was giving them intermittent IM glargine at intervals of two or more hours. And some of the cats got glargine every two hours, some of the cats got glargine only uh, every 20 or 24 hours. And then she was giving them basal sub-Q glargine DID. So they would just get the glargine sub-Q DID and then intermittent IM glargine based on their clinical signs and their blood sugar. Of these 15 cats, all 15 cats survived the DKA and all left the hospital. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> um, which is mystical um, because survival rate of 100% of DKA in any dog or cat, that's weird. I mean, the survival rates are not, generally not that high. And so when you look at these cats, you could certainly argue that maybe they weren't that sick. But there was a recently a paper out of the University of Pennsylvania looking at DKA survival in cats that was also crazy high. It was like 80 to 85 percent survival using just uh, low dose regular or constant CRI of regular insulin. What was also happening in these cats is that all 15 cats survived to discharge, or survived the hospital and were discharged, and a third of those cats subsequently went into remission. So one third of the DKA cats, and these were cats who their initial presentation of the diabetes was DKA. So admittedly, their diabetes was probably a slightly different beast than the basic cat who comes in with diabetic clinical signs and is not DKA. Yet a third of those cats went into remission. Now, the complications that they saw during this, 
surprisingly enough, was not hypoglycemic. So hypoglycemic events were exceedingly rare in these EKA cats receiving glargine. What they did see was hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia, which was likely the result of the DKA itself. Now, insulin can drive glucose into the cell, drive potassium into the cell, drive phosphate into the cell. And so it may be that hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia were related to the glargine administration. However, the argument against that was is that they weren't making them hypoglycemic. So probably this was just related to the DKA. So we've been looking at this protocol as well in treating diabetic cats. And the advantage of the glargine treatment is that what you're doing is not only are you dealing with the DKA, but you're starting to put them on glargine to try and get them into remission. Because we're trying now to see if by using that, can we get more DKA cats to go into remission than we could before. Because the data shows that cats who present initially in DKA, the remission rate is very low probably because those cats don't have islets anymore. You know, they may have gotten diabetes for reasons other than uh, what we'll talk about uh, with the most common reason for uh, diabetes is in the cat. So, based on this time, you recommend to start with Yeah, we, right now, we're, that's what we're doing right now. We're not using regular insulin in cats. We're just going to do glargine until we decide that that was a mistake. <laughs> but so far, <laughs> it hasn't been a mistake. I mean, so far it seems to be working. Okay, briefly we'll talk about prozinc and cats, and then we'll come back and talk, continue talking about insulin. A really nice study uh, on prozinc and cats, 130 cats were enrolled into a study uh, using prozinc. So they got it twice a day. Uh, this was a 45-day study. They looked at control of uh, glycemia based on clinical signs of days 7, 14, 30, and 45. Uh, serum fructosamine concentrations as well as well as looking at BG curves. What they found was that there were significant drops in average blood sugar, significant drops in fructosamine concentrations uh, over time, and significant increases in body weight in the cats who were receiving the prozin. Now this was prozin alone. They weren't comparing it to a different insulin product. It was just uh, diabetic cats that were being uh, treated with prozin. What they found was that polyurin polydipsy had improved in 80% of the cats uh, by day 45. 89% of the cats had a BCS that now put them into a good body condition score. They had a lower 9-hour uh, mean blood glucose concentration, lower serum fructosamine in 84%. Now, hypoglycemia was seen uh, when they looked at why it says 151 of 678. What that means is 151 of the blood glucoses out of the 678 blood glucoses showed a blood sugar that was below 60. However, the thing that was interesting is that while that was biochemical hypoglycemia, very few cats, I think only four or five cats, showed clinical signs of hypoglycemia. And again, this is one of the saving graces of the domestic short hair, is that as long as their glucoses are coming down slowly, even if you make them go low, they don't tend to see. What cats and dogs don't like is a blood sugar that goes from 200 to 30 in 30 minutes, but they can go from 200 to 30 over 24 hours and probably deal with it. So it showed that it was very effective in reducing clinical signs of the diabetes, controlling blood sugar, lowering fructosamine, increasing body weight. Um, but the one thing that you didn't see in that study was a lot of remission. Um, very few of the cats went into remission. And part of the reason was, I think based on what Jackie showed, was that it was just the differences inherent between a basal insulin and uh, PZI insulin. And the other was these cats were not forced to switch food. So the owners were not required to switch their cat to high protein, low carb. Some people did, but a lot of people just left their cats on the same diet. So again, it points out that it is effective and we use frozen in cats. Um, but what we're going to talk about when we come back is the justification for picking what insulin that you're going to pick uh, initially in the cat. All right, so we're supposed to stop. There's a 15-minute break, uh, 15, and then we'll come back and continue talking about uh, insulin.